Zusammenarbeit zwischen den Völkern. Freedom. Bürger der Europäischen Union. Nida, once a fishing village, now a popular holiday resort on Lithuania's Kironian Spit. We're meeting Vidimantas Yakas again. Two years ago, he bought a steamboat, and now he takes tourists on excursions. The first time we were here in 2000, he was still putting to sea in his fishing boat. A lot has changed since then, for him and for Lithuania too, especially after 2004, when the small Baltic state joined the European Union. So we're starting our trip off in the same place as last time, just more than a decade later. We want to see what's become of the people, of their hopes and their fears. Vidimantis was right in 2000 when he said that the situation for the fishermen on the Kironian spit would become more difficult. Small companies in particular will suffer from Lithuania's accession to the EU, he said back then. They'll import fish and the prices will fall, especially because fish from abroad will be cheaper than our own. Like Vidimantis and his son, who's the new helmsman on board, many fishermen have thrown in the towel. Helped by funding from the EU, they've embarked on a new venture, netting tourists and showing them the beauties of the spit and its lagoon. But there's still a bit of room for nostalgia, as Vidimantis passes his old fishing cutter, which is soon due for the scrapyard. I live on shore now, yet I often think of my old comrades when they return to port, he says. How much did they catch today? Actually, it would be great to put to sea again, but that's all behind me now. From Nida, our journey will take us on to the port of Klaipeda. In Konos, we'll be catching up with our technology student, Arnoldus, again. Lithuanian rock and pop music await us in Molotai. After that, we'll be going via the capital, Vilnius, to the old nuclear power station at Ignalina. And then we'll end up back in Klaipeda again. Not far from the spit, near the port of Klaipeda, we turn up at the estate of Manfredus Skroblis. He farms just under 100 hectares. Manfredus is a born farmer, just like his grandfather and great-grandfather. He's remained true to the soil, even though it's become a lot harder for him since Lithuania joined the EU. Even when we visited him the first time, he already knew he would have to make some changes. Back then, he was still optimistic and thought joining the EU at least wouldn't make things worse. But we'll still have to be more flexible, he said. Where once there were fields, now there are villas belonging to people from the cities. Farmland has now become building land, not least because many farmers in the area have sold up and moved away. Manfredus has focused on dairy farming. He's got 68 cows and has doubled the number of milking machines to eight. But even so, his farm still looks pretty modest compared to the factory farms in Western Europe. The milk tanker calls every other day. Manfredus is not allowed to produce as much as he wants. Like every farmer in the EU, he has a quota of milk that he mustn't exceed. 
whether it makes sense to him or not, and Freitas has to stick to it. And of course, take care of the massive bureaucracy and paperwork. Still, he manages to draw a positive conclusion. Without the support from the EU, he says, I wouldn't have been able to buy my milking machines, because they are very, very expensive. The EU took over half the cost, which was a huge help for me. That's why, he adds, I'm very glad the country joined the EU. Manfredis and his son chat about their cattle. Algerdas has just completed his high school certificate and hopes to take over his father's farm one day. He intends to concentrate solely on organic products. His livestock will be bred and reared according to strict environmental criteria. Organic is modern. Organic is the order of the day in the European Union. But will he be able to stand up to competition from the huge agricultural combines in the West? Why does he want to be a farmer at all? Even as a child, I've always enjoyed being on the farm, El Gerdes replies. I couldn't live in the city. I wouldn't have anything to do there, he says. I like animals, and they like me. That's why I want to be a farmer. We drive further to Connors. Here they're really in step with modern times. At the Axis Power Utility, Arnoldus Bagdonas and his colleagues are working on an electronic measuring device. It will take remote readings of household power consumption and bill it via wireless networks. Arnoldus is the team leader. In his early career, he spent five years at Siemens in Germany. The first time we met him, Arnoldus was still studying at the technology center in Konus. Although I would like to work for a foreign company, he said then, it would have to be in Lithuania. Going abroad doesn't interest me at all. <laughs> He's been lucky and found a job in his hometown. Unlike many young people of his age, who have stayed in Germany, England or France. In recent years, and especially since joining the EU, Lithuania has lost a large portion of its workforce, especially highly qualified people like Arnoldus, who left the country and have never come back. I got a lot out of my time in Germany, he says. As far as working with my colleagues and also with various departments, I learnt a lot. The problems in Lithuania are the same, he notes, and so are the solutions. Time to knock off, as usual. It's getting late, and Arnoldus has to rush to pick his son up from kindergarten. Rokas was born in Germany. His wife, Yogita, and their young daughter are already waiting for him at home. The family is doing well. They're not rich, but they can still afford a nice flat on the edge of Konus. The decision to return home wasn't easy for the young couple. Arnoldus had a well-paid job, and they'd made some friends in Germany. All in all, they were very comfortable there. In fact, Yogita would have preferred to stay longer, but Arnoldus wanted to go back. The Bagdonas family aren't unusual. 40,000 Lithuanians, that's more than 1% of the population, leave the country every year. Most of them are younger people looking for a better life in the West. For Lithuania, it's turning into a disaster. As qualified workers emigrate, 
they leave behind them a shrinking, aging population. We really came back because of Rokas, Yogita stresses. If they'd stayed in Germany, their son wouldn't have learned Lithuanian. On this point, both of them agree, although Arnoldus adds that, in reality, it was also a question of mentality. They would have had to change and become more German, as he puts it, in order to integrate. If you live in a foreign country, he thinks, you have to take on its ways and traditions. With a certain amount of national pride, he says, it's a good feeling when a lot of people come back to a small country like Lithuania, which only has a population of three million people. <coughs> Off now to a music festival just outside Molotai, some 100 kilometers northeast of the capital Vilnius. Every year, young people head here from all over the country to enjoy homegrown rock and pop music. Modesta Svoba is one of those taking part. He's a presenter with the private radio station Zip FM. Modestas asks the singer Gidre who's the star turn this evening, whether it's true that she drinks a raw egg before every concert to improve her voice. Of course, she replies. Gidre sings her hit song, Gara, which means good, or in this case, more like feeling good. Her songs are about love and happiness. She wants to entertain her audiences, not bend their ears with political concerns. And she only sings in Lithuanian, her mother tongue. Next morning, we're in the capital, Vilnius. <laughs> in a tiny studio, we meet Modestas again. He and a colleague are presenting the morning show. When the CD jams. Come on, entertain the people, his colleague shouts. <laughs> it's a glitch, but that's not a problem for the two upbeat DJs. Getting everybody in a good mood is their aim, every morning, everywhere in the country. Having fun on the one hand and talking to listeners about their problems on the other. That's not easy, especially at a time when the international financial crisis has wiped the smile off of many Lithuanian faces. <laughs> Many young Lithuanians really are leaving, says Modestas. Only those with a job, friends or solid ties are staying. Young Lithuanians are hungry for new things, experiences and new prospects. But it's hard, he goes on. Many jobs are taken by older people. I don't have anything against them, but that means young people have no chance to make something of themselves. The skyline of Vilnius. Since Lithuania joined the EU, most of the investment has come from Scandinavian banks and companies. The country became a member of the West, extricating itself from the Russian sphere of influence, economic as well as political, for good. But at the same time, the country took on the risks of a free market economy and was hit head-on by the global financial crisis in 2008 and 2009. The economy collapsed and the number out of work soared. 
welfare benefits were slashed and taxes rocketed. Without any help from the EU, the Lithuanian government embarked on a rigid austerity program. Lithuania, a country with more than a thousand years of cultural history between tradition and modernity. The alarm system is working fine in the test simulation. We're in a high-tech company on the edge of Vilnius. Kestutis Yesienis develops laser equipment for scientific establishments, research laboratories or, as here, for Spain's civil guard. Using a laser beam, it's possible to detect the presence of explosives in the vehicles. The project Kestutis and his team are working on is subsidized by Brussels. When we first visited him about 11 years ago, he had great hopes for EU membership, not least better market access. My dream is to be accepted as an equal partner and take part in joint research programs, he said back then. Until now, we've always been just an Eastern European partner. Kestutis's dream has come true. The EU estimated the cost of the explosives project at around 4 million euros, a very lucrative contract for a smallish company with less than 100 workers. But the clock is ticking. How's it going? Kestutis wants to know. We'll soon be able to present the first results and photographs of the device, says his R&D manager. We are now a more equal partner than we were before we joined the EU, Kestutis stresses. You notice it in this sort of joint venture, and we can also submit tenders. Before the EU accession, we were really just from the East. Now, he says, we're officially part of the European Union. Kestutis is always on the go. He realized early on that the Lithuanian market alone was too small for his high-tech equipment. That's why he now also sells his laser devices in Asia. Today, he's on his way to the city hall. A meeting of the so-called Dovu clubs. Young entrepreneurs, Managers and leading scientists and researchers from around the country come together at irregular intervals to talk and exchange views. Kestutis also takes advantage of this opportunity to network. The future of Lithuania, discussed and planned in an historical setting. That makes it a fitting place for a lecture on the country's past. For the self-confident Lithuanians, modernity and tradition seem to go hand in hand. We drive further northeast. The former Ignalina nuclear power station is located some two hours from Vilnius. It was shut down at the end of 2009. There we meet Valentin Kuznetsov again. He's one of a thousand workers now winding up the plant. Four thousand have already been laid off. Shutting down Ignalina was the EU's main condition for accession. Both reactors are of the same series as those in Chernobyl. Ignalina, which was one of the biggest nuclear power stations in the world, provided as much as 75% of Lithuania's energy needs. Valentin came to the plant as a young engineer and has spent his whole working life here. He never had any doubts about its safety. When asked about problems, he said back then... No, uh, no um, problems, technical problems of this, uh, of this station, of this type of reactor, about Ignalina nuclear power plant. For many years, Valentin worked here, in the plant's nerve center, and he knows the old technology like the back of his hand.
Sometimes he still meets an old colleague. Like many during the Soviet era, he studied nuclear physics in Moscow. We wonder whether it's this old Soviet-style faith in technology that makes him, from our point of view, so uncritical. Valentin takes us into the fuel rod chamber. The rods have already been taken out of commission, but it will take another 20 years before everything has been wound down. And once again we see his unshakable faith in the safety of a type of reactor that is seen worldwide as one of the most dangerous. Talking about the protective casing of the reactor that was once beneath our feet, Valentin says, we could carry out any work here without danger. There were constant checks. As long as the warning lights were green, he explains, there was no radiation. Although it will still take a long time before the old nuclear power plant has been dismantled completely, a new one is planned close by. Preliminary test drilling has already taken place. Despite Chernobyl and Fukushima, most Lithuanians remain in favor of the project. The fear of becoming dependent on Russia for energy supply seems greater than concern about the risks of nuclear power. The new plant is due to come online in 2020. Valentin takes us to Vizaginas, a specially built town where most of the plant's workers live. The majority of them are Russian. Many engineers and nuclear scientists from Moscow originally settled here. Valentin was one of them, among the first to move into what was in the 1970s seen as a town for privileged workers. The privileges are now long gone, and many here are out of work. But they still haven't gone home to Russia, probably because the standard of living is still better here in Lithuania. At a memorial with inscriptions in both Lithuanian and Russian, Valentin gives a somewhat misty-eyed account of the old days when the town was still young. Back then there weren't as many buildings, he remembers. Lots of people were walking around with prams. It was a great time, maybe not always easy, but it was interesting. Of course, he goes on, the residents here have got older but I hope wiser too. The situation is difficult, he explains, but there's no point shedding tears over the past. Before we take our leave of Valentin, he shows us something else, something special, maybe even unique. In front of the town hall, there's a huge indicator showing not only the time and the temperature, but also radiation levels, 10 microrems, everything okay. Much relieved, we continue our journey. We finish back where we started, on the Baltic, in the port of Klaipeda. Is Lithuania on a new course? That was the question we asked ourselves when we started. Has so much changed by joining the EU? The changes to the port are typical, perhaps even symbolic of the developments in the country as a whole. It has been constantly expanded and modernized, which wouldn't have happened at all if not for pressure from Brussels. The old port director, Algimantas Kamaroskas, knew that back then. We hope that the EU will be a positive influence on our economic development, he told us. That, I believe, will have a great effect on the operations of our port, especially in transshipment. The EU subsidized the infrastructure, the access roads and rail links leading to the dockside facilities. Kamaroskas also profited from the move, switching jobs from director of the port to director of an international shipping company. But he remains ambitious. 
In the next two to three years, he says, exuding confidence, we want to double or even triple our turnover. I'm already looking forward to the new challenges. In the past 10 years, the port itself has more than doubled the amount of freight it handles. Whereas it once mainly dealt with Russian goods, now it's goods from the EU. At the end of our trip, our impression is that Lithuania set course for Europe a long time ago.